All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to start, so you better take your seats. Like I said, this is probably the only event in the country that's going to be starting on time. That's what happens when you have Swedish people helping with the organization. They're very similar to the Swiss. If you've ever, oh, we got some Swiss people? All right, cool. They're the ones appreciating, you know, so the ones that have been on time. <laughs> Again, those who are now uh, tapping into the live stream, uh, welcome. We're now going to enter into the next session. So as I was saying earlier, part of our mission and our goal with Cry for Zion is to help kind of give uh, a push to modern day Christian Zionism. When you study the history of Christian Zionism, it's Christian Zionists that were very influential in the establishing of the State of Israel and the Israeli Defense Forces since the time of the Maccabees. That is revolutionary and huge. And so today I also want to recognize two of our very special guests who have helped establish a very important role here in Jerusalem by establishing the Christian Zionist Embassy. We have Merv and Merla Watson sitting up there in the back. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful friends of Israel who took it upon themselves when the embassies of the world were rejecting Jerusalem, they said, we're going to have a Christian embassy in Jerusalem. It's about time since the Watsons and their friends who helped establish the Christian Zionist embassy that we have a Christian Zionist movement for the Temple Mount and that will help support the Jewish cause and the Jewish prayer and Jewish sovereignty on the Temple Mount. So on that note, I want to now also uh, welcome our next speaker. She is passionate for Jerusalem, has uh, made the brave step of making Aliyah from the other parts of the world, so to speak, all the way down south, not south like in America, guys. We're talking about down South Africa. <laughs> Her name is Anna Rina Heyman. She worked successfully in the broadcast and marketing industry in South Africa before throwing her weight in with the Jewish Agency for Israel in Johannesburg. And I'm probably butchering a lot of these words. Yeah. Forgive me. No, I'm Israeli. I can do what I want, okay? Is it beseder? Yalla. <laughs> there, she was head of marketing, mainly pr promoting Aliyah, which I personally, my answer to anti-Semitism anti in the world Make Aliyah. Make Aliyah. We need the Jewish people to come here. This is the only place in the world where Jews are safe and where Jews are free to be Jews. <laughs> so thank you, Anna Rina, for your efforts in raising awareness of the Jewish community in your country and you yourself making the brave step of making Aliyah. She decided to put word to deed and made Aliyah to Israel seven years ago. In Israel, she continued working with special projects of the Jewish Agency's Aliyah department. She joined the City of David in 2014 and started the Jerusalem Watch project. In November 2018, so we need to uh, congratulate her on her new venture, she launched a new biblical ad advocacy program called Align with Zion. So please welcome our special guest, Anna Rina. Thank you. I'm also Israeli, so I negotiated seven minutes, so just remember that. So I'm going to get going right now. Guys, um, I started, my name is Anarina Hyman. I started um, Align with Zion 
which is so important for where we are right now because this whole conference is for getting us back on track and just getting us to the point where we aligned correctly. If somebody comes to drag you out of alignment, then the whole thing collapses, and that's why it's so important that we um, speak about that today. The city of David apparently was rediscovered in 1867. I do not agree with that. It was discovered in 2014. That's when I discovered it. And all of you need to discover it as well. Is there anybody, anybody has been to the city of David? Okay, no, the people that hasn't been to the city of David? Gotta get there. I just wanna say this because this is very important. The old city is not ancient biblical Jerusalem. So if you come all the way to the old city and you think that you came to Jerusalem, to Israel, and you didn't get to the city of David, you never made it to Jerusalem, except for Temple Mount. That stays exactly where it is. And this is important for us to understand. I want to say something about sanctification. If you look at how things are sanctified, we have the world, we have Israel, we have Jerusalem. And this is how the Jewish people have prayed for um, 1,800 and a little bit more over since the, um, even from Daniel's, so it's over 2,000 years. From there, we have Jerusalem, and when you are here at Temple Mount, you have the Temple Mount itself, the Chatzer, the court, and then you have the Holy, and then you have the Holy of Holies. So every time we keep on sanctifying, and this thing is being brought into a certain alignment. If somebody's going to start messing with that, that's where the problem comes in. So every time when we discover something beautiful, there is always something that's going to try to tr um, 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 trace your track of it, to get you off track from what's happening. And this is very important for me. The people sitting here today are serious about how to align themselves with, with Zion, but also with God. You are the truth seekers of trying to understand that. But when I was working at the city of David, it was really, really interesting. I received a lot of emails saying, do you guys know actually where the Temple Mount is? Um, other people actually asked us uh, where the temple was situated. Other people asked me, is it true? And you can see the difference between the people asking you. Those who really want to know come and they say, can you send us more to understand this? And then there are people that will just tell you, listen, you guys are wrong, we know it, because somebody superimposed temple into the city of David, and from there, people just believed it. So that, for me, is very, very important, that we do not have the collateral damage. I hope that this conference will be so successful that we won't have a conference like this again, because we have to move forward. Like we say, Kadima, there's so much that needs to be done. So you guys are the people that have to go and tell people how to align with Zion. I just want um, the next one. I'm supposed to press a button here. Oh, that button has to be pressed. Okay, that's us. Okay, but I want to, this. I want you to look at this um, picture quickly. This is the third temple. That is going to happen. Uh, for those who want to put it somewhere else, I don't care, that is happening, okay? I want you to focus on the scripture that we have here. It says, um, as for you, son of man, describe the temple and the plan of it to the house of Israel so that they can be ashamed of their iniquities. Isn't that funny? Isn't that weird? Show the temple plan, and then everybody's going to go, um, wow, see how far we strayed. Everything in that temple plan stands for something. If you have something physical, it's actually reverberating with something massively spiritual. And every one of those measurements stands for something specific. And that's why we need to study that. I want to show you also that it says, show it to the house of Israel. If, we do, if you go a little bit back in history, the kingdom split. There was the house of Judah and the house of Israel. The house of Judah knows about this. They've been praying for 2,000 years to get back to this. It's the house of Israel that needs to start staring at that thing and start internalizing it, guys, so that we can understand what's going to happen. And that's what I give you guys today. Get a picture like this and start aligning yourself and the people around you. It says, Lema'an, it's for the sake of my brothers and my friends that I have to ask for the shalom, for the wholeness, for the harmony of Zion and Jerusalem to come back. So take it to your friends, take it to your family. Um, um, I've started something new. I've started a new tradition here, and I want to invite you guys to that. I got a very, very special scribe to write for us the word Zion um, on, on, on um, club, how do you say, on parchment. This is on Torah parchment, 
And for the Jewish people, uh, most of them living in America, we always had something that said Mizrach, East, because we had to know how to face to Jerusalem. I want you guys to get something like this in your house, to, uh, to place it on the wall that faces Jerusalem, and that you can physically start aligning yourself when you pray. Know where Jerusalem is, know where the true location of Jer Jerusalem is, but more than that, also know where Temple Mount stands much higher. Temple Mount is on top of the city of David. Temple was n never inside the city of David. The person that, and I'm finishing this with this, the person <laughs> that, I hear the music, the Oscar music starting. The person that placed the Temple Mount on the s east side of the city of David is dragging you down. You have to come up to Temple Mount. That's where we have to serve him. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anna Rina, thank you so much. That was amazing. I think you guys are inspired a little bit, right? My next guest is a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, activist, uh, passionate for the Temple Mount, and has been working tireless, tirelessly for many, many years in the uh, uh, educational system here in Israel and around the world, teaching Jews all over in, in kindling the, the, the fire in, 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 in the Jewish community to learn about the Temple Mount and to educate the future generations of Jewish children who one day will grow up to have a Temple Mount awareness. Because that's the thing, we need to educate our future ch uh, uh, generation so when they grow up, this is not a foreign concept to them. So my next guest is named uh, Rabbi Mordechai uh, Persoff, who is the head of the Mahon Migdash here in Jerusalem, who is an amazing, amazing, wonderful guy, and you're going to love him, I promise you. Hanukkah Sameach, Tadah Rabbah. As it says up here, I'm Mordechai from the Mikdash Educational Center. Mikdash is he the Hebrew for temple, the holy temple. And I'm into education. I'm not going to talk to you about politics. We're not even going to go like uh, they talked before, a thousand, eight hundred years ago. Not even... 3,000 years ago, everybody says, Jerusalem, Yerushalayim is 3,000 years old. But we're going to go back 5,779 years to what? To the creation. We're talking about the creation according to the Bible, according to Genesis. And everything in Judaism is about the Tanakh, about the Bible. That's our source. Everything is about tradition. Judaism is tradition. It's more than history. And if we're talking about where the temple was. We're talking about the tradition. And to understand about the Mikdash, about the Holy Temple, we have to start a lot before Solomon, a lot before Shlomo, not even back to the tabernacle, to the first so-called temple. We have to go back to where everything started from. Where did everything start from? From creation. Where? Where in the creation? Eden is right, but that's not what, that's not what it says. Man wasn't created in the Garden of Eden, who was taken from the land and placed, we'll see it in a minute. Nothing happened here, did it? Okay. He was placed in the Garden of Eden, but man was created, we'll see it soon. It just says from the land, from this place, exactly under the dome of the the rock, the foundation stone, everything in the world started from Mount Moriah. Everything in the world, all of us, the whole world, started from the foundation stone. So if we want to know why everybody yearns back to this place, Jews 
and non-Jews because we were all created from here. According to the Talmud, the foundation stone, we'll see it soon in a maybe we'll see it in the, in the next picture, in a better picture. According to the Talmud, they symbolize the foundation stone. I like to say a heart. We'll talk about the heart in a minute. But according to the Talmud, I'll say it first in Hebrew, when it's called the Chevel Tabur. The Tabur is the, huh? Umbilical cord. Th thank you. What is the umbilical cord? The baby, before it was born, in the womb, that's what it, the baby or the, uh, how do you say, uterus, right? See? Okay. I'm Israeli. Okay. <laughs> yeah. it, it gets everything, the food, the whole life, oxygen from, the, uh, how do you say it? Umbilical cord, thank you, umbilical cord. So, if the foundation stone is the umbilical cord of the, of the whole world, meaning from this place, even before we had the temple, it gives life to the whole world. I'm, in, I'm into education. I go to kids, teenagers, adults, and I, I tell them like this. If, you put my, if I put my hand here, what do I feel? My heart, obviously, because I'm putting my hand on, on the heart, okay? But if I feel here, and here, and here, I still feel, I feel the, the heart, the pulse, I feel the heart. And if I run, and uh, my heart pumps fast, so I can feel also here fast. If I'm, if I'm sick, so if I feel my heart here, I feel it's pumping slow. And also every, anywhere else in, in my body. And if the heart doesn't work. So if this is the heart of the world. If it's alive and it's healthy. Not only the Temple Mount and not only Jerusalem so-called is healthy. But the whole world. So when we want the Mikdash to be built. It's actually bringing us back to life. And if we have problems in the world, it's because our heart, the world's heart, is sick. That's what it's all about. And why is everybody running back to this place? Because we all started from here. The world was created from this place. And so-called exactly like a small baby, like we said before. We have some seed, and it grows, it grows, it grows, and the whole world is built. That's exactly where we were also. Can we see another picture? Let's see. Why is this in here? We'll, see in, we'll get to this in a minute. Let's get, get, get to here. So if man was created from here, it's obvious we all want to come back home. This is our home. The whole humanity's home. That's why when I pray, the, the lady who talked before, she said we were, when you were in South Africa, you were looking for Yerushalayim, you were looking for Israel. That's why we all pray. Even if we're not on the Temple Mount, and obviously if we're on the Temple Mount, but even if we're in, how did you say, Sweden and America and South Africa, doesn't matter if you're in space. You always point your prayers to this place because that's where we all started from. Now let's go back to the picture we saw before because we're going to get it to later on. What does this have to do with it? Who is this? It's the high priest. High priest on Yom Kippur in the Deva tournament and he's actually the only person in the world that can get into the Holy of Holies and here we see the Ark of the Covenant on the, the, stone, stone, uh, the foundation stone. We can't be there, but we can all connect all together to one place. One place, and you saw the temple model that we brought outside. When people pray, and if I would open now the western wall, which side of the temple will I see? The back, exactly. People think if you'd open the temple, you would open the Western Wall, you'd just walk up to the temple. 
Let's go back again. Okay, you can see the western wall up here. From this point, we, we will see the back of the temple, the holy of holies, the entrance and temples from the west. We're going to get to it later on. From the east, I'm sorry, from the east. And the western wall is the back of the, of the temple, but that's the most important place in the whole temple. So we started from creation, and we're going on to the, crea to the creation of, the, of man and Eve. From here, if you talked about the Garden of Eden, from here they were taken. Look back in the verses in, in, in Genesis. They were taken and placed in the Garden of Eden. And after the sin, after, I don't know if it was an apple, whatever it was, when they, they were placed back here on the Temple Mount. And the first sacrifice in the world, and the sacrifice isn't just to sacrifice on yourself. Sacrifice in Hebrew is called korban. Korban is something that gets us together. Litkarev. To, together. Together with whom? With Hashem. That's the essence of the Temple Mount, of Haramuriya, and that's the essence of the Temple service, which we'll get to it later on. Noah, when they came out of the ark, exactly in the same place, they gave their sacrifices, but the first time in the Torah, we found, you find Mount Moriah, where is it? With whom? Abraham, it's not exactly, because it doesn't say the Mount Moriah. It says, the land of Moriah. In Hebrew, Eretz HaMoriah. But it's actually Mount Moriah, and we're looking where the temple should be built. We're looking for a mountain. How does it say? Tuli here, see it? I already got your Bible. <laughs> no? okay. okay, so it says, again, he said, take your son, your favorite son, Yitzchak, who you love, and go to the land of Moriah. And one of, uh, and it says in Hebrew, Alechad Harim, Asher Omar Elecha. We'll look on one of the mountains. You have to find some kind of mountain. We'll later we'll see David together with Samuel the prophet trying to find exactly which mountain it's all about. But our tradition starts a lot before the temple was ever built. It's from the creation through Adam and Eve, Noah, and afterwards also, obviously, let's see them, Abraham and Ishaq on the Temple Mount. And I want you to listen carefully to what the Torah tells us, what Abraham calls this place. And Abraham named that site Adonai Yir'eh. When's the present saying on this mount? I want to say it first in Hebrew. Asher yamer hayom behar Adonai Yir'eh. Yir'eh is to be seen. So Hashem, Abraham says, why do I want to be, what's so important on this mount, mountain? On this mountain, Hashem can be seen. Hashem is present. He always watches us, wherever we are. The problem is not, is Hashem watching us? He's always guiding us, wherever we are. The, the thing we can feel, we can't really see Him, but feel Him and be Part of Hashem, Asher Yamer Hayom, Bahar Hashem, on the mountain of Hashem, Yerae, Hashem will be seen. So, why do we want to ascend to the Temple Mount? We don't want to be visitors. We want to be seen and we want to see. We want to be close to Hashem. You're even not allowed in the Jewish halacha according to the Jewish guidance, to go on the Temple Mount as a sightseer. You're not allowed to. You're not allowed to. If I want to go even into a synagogue, I'm not talking about a non-Jew, I'm talking about a Jew. A Jew isn't allowed to go to this, in, into a synagogue just to see how nice the synagogue is. You don't come to the Temple Mount as a Jew 
to go sightseeing. Maybe there's nicer, nicer places in the world to see. You go up to the Temple Mount to be close to Hashem, to pray. That's the only reason, reason or the best reason to go up to the Temple Mount. You want to go sightseeing? There's a lot of nice places all over Israel. But you go up to the Temple Mount to feel close to Hashem. Even, exactly like Abraham says, before the Temple was built. Because the place itself is holy. The world, we have the world from all the world. The land of Israel is holier than other places. Jerusalem is holier than any other city. And the Temple Mount is holier than any other mountain. And the place of the foundation stone like we saw before is the Holy of Holies. And I can't be there. Not even any priest, not any Jew. Only the high priest and only on a special day. And that's exactly, we talk about getting close to Hashem. That's exactly what Jacob saw in his dream. Every week we read in the Torah a different verse. We're bound in the middle of the book of Genesis. We read this about two or three weeks ago. And Jacob saw a ladder. And on the ladder he saw angels going up and angels going down. If I see somebody going up a ladder now, and then after a few minutes, I see two feet coming down. So who, who's coming down? Probably the same person I saw going up. So I pray to Hashem, and my prayers go up, but they don't stay there. Because the angels go up and down, and up and down. And I pray to Hashem, pray to God, and He gives me the blessing. That's what the temple is all about. That's what we said before. It's the heart of the world. So I pray, I ask something from Hashem. I don't know if He always answers me. Maybe I'm not worthy. But through this place, He gives us the blessing to the whole world. That's what Solomon says. In the book of Kings. And then after he gives me, not me, personally, you and the whole world, from the same place, we also say thank you. And praise. Praise God from that place. That's exactly what Rabbi Wise said before. From that place, we're going to praise Hashem. And the light from that place will spread to the whole world. But before all, our fathers wanted, maybe they wanted to build a temple. Hashem already told Abraham, we have to go into our first exile down to Egypt. 210 years we were in Egypt. Came out of the Egyptian exile. Got the Torah on Mount Sinai. And right after we got the Torah and the tablets, Hashem tells us to build him a small temple, the tabernacle. Something that we can move around from place to place. But maybe the first temple we had, it's not as nice, not as big as the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, teaches us that it doesn't matter the size. It matters what happens inside. It matters what we do inside. And that's what the temple is all about. Going to the Ark of the Covenant. The tablets, look at the, look at the shape of the tablets. If I would ask you how the tablets are, everybody would go like this. You know why? Because Michelangelo, when he read, learned the Bible, said that's how he decided the tablets were. Okay? So then, but according to the Torah, the tablets were square. And more like this, a rectangle, and they fit exactly in the ark, which actually wasn't just one box of gold. It was a gold box on the outside, a gold box on the inside, in the middle, wood. To show us, doesn't, whatever you show outside, also has to be 
in the inside. So we have the tabernacle. Here's a picture from a very interesting place to go. We also give guides, uh, guided tours over there. In Ariel, there's a nice big model of the tabernacle. And where is this? Anybody have a guess? Yep, it's Tfilo. It's Tfilo. We're not in, not in Yerushalayim yet. It takes about 440 years till David conquers Yerushalayim. We have the, the tabernacle. It's already built, half built. It's in Tfilo. And only when King David starts and conquers Yerushalayim and learns together, like I said before, with the Samuel, Prophet Samuel, exactly where to build the temple, only then does King David decide and he's able to build the temple in Jerusalem. But we know that he doesn't build the temple. Who will build it? Solomon will build it. Solomon will build it, but they learn exactly. How do they know? I find this fast, I'll do it. Doesn't matter. Okay. And the blessing to Binyamin, Moses, just before they come and go into Israel, Moses blesses Binyamin. And the temple is built exactly in the place of two tribes, Jehuda and Binyamin. And it says like this And of Binyamin, he said, Beloved of Hashem, in Hebrew, Yedid Adonai. Let's say in Hebrew first, Lebinyamin Amar, Yedid Adonai, Yishkon Levetach Alav, Chofef Alav Kol Ayom, Uven Ktefav Shachen. The temple was built in the place of the tribe of Binyamin, the youngest kid. Why? Why was that? Binyamin was the only son that didn't bow down to who? To Esav. He wasn't born, but he was the only one who didn't bow. He was the only son who didn't participate in what? Selling Yosef. Because we can't build the temple if we're not together. And that's why he's called Yedid Hashem, the beloved of Hashem, the beloved of, of God. And Hashem will dwell in his part. Where exactly? Uven ktefav shachen. Between two shoulders. You have one hill and another hill. You have one hill which isn't very high, a little lower. That's a temple mount. That's exactly how they knew where to build the temple. Here we have King David bringing up the ark of ark to uh, Jerusalem, he wants to build it. He says, it can't be that I'm living in a big mansion and Hashem doesn't have a house. And maybe that's what we have to say today. Look at our houses. Look how we live. Look around us. We have everything we need. Everybody has a house now. Except Hashem. That's what it's all about. We have the Temple Mount. But Hashem doesn't have his house yet. That's what David, King David said about 3,000 years ago. And that's what we're saying now. When will we build a house for Hashem? How can we live in our house when there's nothing on the Temple Mount? And King Solomon built the temple. Let's look at it in a video. We'll get back to this in a minute. Binyan Amikdash itnase le gova shel keshishim metorim. Bachazito nitzvu shnei amudei nechoshet mefoarim anikraim b'shem yachin uvoaz. Kol amud aya be gova shel keasara metorim uve koter shel shnei metorim uvoashehem. כותרות מאותרות. פנים המקדש הנקרא ההיכל מצופה היה כולו בזהב טהור, ובו בנוסף על מנורת הזהב ושולחן לחם הפנים שהובאו מן המשכן, בנה שלמה המלך עוד עשר מנורות זהב ועשרה שולחנות. 
בחצר העשרה, סמוך למזבח העולה, הקים שלמה המלך מקווה טהרה מפואר, הנקרא בשם ים של שלמה, אשר בבסיסו 12 שברים, המסמלים שהעולם עומד על עבודת הקורבנות. רגלי השברים היו מנוקבים בתחתיתם, והיו נוגעים ישירות במי מעיין שהיה עובר מתחת לרצפת העזרה, כך שהמים היו קשרים לטבילה. וכן בנה עשרה כיורים ניידים מנחושת... אוקיי, אז אנחנו ראינו כמה מהם שלנו שלנו פרויקטים, כמו שאנחנו ראינו לילדים גם כדי שיש להם קצת מולטימדיה, כדי שיש להם קצת מולטימדיה. Of, of, the holy, of, the, of the holy temple. And something very interesting, not everybody knows, but everybody who lo- learns the book of Kings has to know this, that Solomon added another 10 menorahs and another 10 shorebread tables. The menorah symbolizes the, the light, like they said before. The temple symbolizes the bread. And the blessing, In the temple is also from the Torah, the light, but also we also pray in the temple for the rain, for bread, for the everyday work. And if we saw it before, let's see another picture of, I'm going the wrong direction, I think, of the holy priest in, the high priest in the holy of holies. The first temple stood for 410 years. It was destructed. For about a thousand years, the people of Israel, the only thing they knew is that in the center of their life, they had the temple. Why am I saying a thousand years? Since they came out of Egypt, the desert, Joshua, Shilom, King David, and about 400 and something years of, of, the first, of the first temple. For about a thousand years, all they knew is living, and in the center of their life, they had the temple. And when the temple was destructed, I'm going again, okay. And when the temple was destructed, people said, how can we live without the temple? They would drink wine and they say, well, I can drink wine. They would pour wine on the, on the altar. I can't, I can't eat meat because it reminds me of the sacrifices. Wait, I can't even drink a cup of water because we have the water libation. In other words, people said, how can we live without the temple? And the problem now is, not that people say, how can we live without the temple? But our problem is that there's too many people who are saying exactly the opposite. How can we live with the temple? And that's what we're here for. And we're talking about education, that's what it's all about. The people have to start understanding that you can't live without the temple. It's not life. Something was so trivial. Everybody knew that you can't live without feeling the divine presence, but they lost it. And we went into to the exile, another exile. On the rivers of Babylon, we sat and we cried and we yearned for Zion, for the temple, And then the Babylonians went off the history. We don't see them anymore. And then came a king, which we own a lot. Which king? King Cyrus. King Cyrus. Hope I can find it fast enough. And the picture is not King Cyrus, I'm just using this picture. King Cyrus comes and tells us, you were here enough. 
He doesn't say it, it by himself. He said, Hashem told me. You were here for 70 years. And remember the 70? You were here for 70 years. It's time. Thus said King Cyrus of Persia, God of heaven, or God of the world, has given me all the kingdoms of earth, and Hashem, He charged me with building Him a house in Yerushalayim. And not, that, not just that he, that he charged me, and then He turns to the Jews and tells them, what are you doing here? Any one of you of His people, may His God be with Him, let him go to Yerushalayim that is in Yehuda and build, let's say it's simpler, go build the temple. Just go build. You hear enough. Go build the temple. It was only 70 years. I mean, even after 70 years, people started to forget. But we know that there were people that saw the first, I'll get to this in a second, the first temple built, and when they saw the second temple being built, they said, what is it all about? We saw something much nicer. But they said, don't worry. Eventually, the second temple will even be nicer than the first temple. And some people say that the next temple, it says, the next temple will be nicer. We're not talking about the second temple, but like, I don't remember what your name was. Arena said before, we're talking about the third temple. The third temple will be much nicer than the first and the second. Doron talked before about the moving of the embassy, when he said in the beginning, not the embassy, that Donald Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem. We made a special coin. Let's take him off a minute. We'll leave just this. The menorah, like they said before, was always the symbol of the people of Israel. Always. We'll see it in the end in different places. Always the symbol of Israel. But we felt that the prophecies are coming back to life. Exactly like after... 70 years of exile, something happened. And we came back and we rebuilt the temple, but we needed to get a push. We needed to get a push from a non Jewish king, a non Jewish leader, to push us and say, go do it. Because sometimes we fall asleep. We forget. And sometimes we talk about the chauffeur. Somebody talked before about the chauffeur that the end of their autonomy. What is the chauffeur all about? It's to wake you up. Wake up. So sometimes you have a small chauffeur that wakes you up. And if you can find a nice big chauffeur, it's better. But sometimes the chauffeur doesn't just blow, it hits you on your head. And sometimes if we don't wake up, we need to have somebody to push, push us, and that's what you're here for also. To help push and rebuild the temple. And when, I don't know, I don't know, give a, maybe the biggest leader of the world now, says that Jerusalem is the center of the world, it has to be some kind of prophecies, and it's exactly after 70 years of independence. That's it. Look at the words. And he charged me, I don't know if you can see it, I can hardly see it, and he charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem. So it, you're right. It's an only, only an embassy. But Doron, you said before, it starts with something like that. But we have the power just to say this is our land. We were talking about the Maccabees. Simon the Maccabee. Well, everybody talks about uh, 
Ju Judah. But Simon, another brother, says, we didn't steal any land. This is our land. This is our Temple Mount. It belongs to us. We're not going to go up as visitors. And we just have to get the small push to remind us it's time. It's time to start and build the real house in Jerusalem. And it's possible. And exactly like in the second temple, it wasn't easy in the beginning. It wasn't easy. We're just going to go back to, we have here the two kings. We have Cyrus and the Persian Empire, the original Persian Empire. And we have Donald Trump, like we said before. I'm going the wrong direction. And exactly like the second temple in the beginning, it wasn't so fancy, it wasn't so big, but they started. A lot of the Jews even stayed in exile. But they started and they rebuilt whenever they can. Just go and start. You can see the western wall just underneath here. And let's see from the other direction. Okay, this is from the east towards the west. This is the entrance to the temple. Let's get a glimpse inside. So this is the model you see outside. Usually we rebuilt it with the participants. People who came here early enough helped us build it. And you can get a feeling that you're being part of the building of the, of the temple itself. Obviously, the holy temple has to be 50, 50 times bigger. And we're going in from the west to the east. You see the women's court. And we see somebody talked about before. Dr. Meida talked about the 15 steps going up, ascending into the temple, because it's still a mountain. You have to ascend and go up and up and up. And as we go in, passing the altar, it wasn't a copper altar. And the holy temple is already built from stone. And let's get inside. In the second temple, we really only had one menorah, one shorebird table, one golden altar for the incense. And as we said before, not everybody can go in. Some of the festivals, they used to take out the vessels so everybody can see them. But as we said, this is the heart of the world. So when the service is happening here, it works in the whole world. And exactly like they said before, Yecheskel, if you learn about the temple, if you understand what the how important the temple is, it's as if you build it. If you understand what the lighting of the menorah is, if you understand what placing the shortbread is, is your part of it. Even if I can't be, go inside, and everybody has this section where you can go in, but everybody is part of something big. And if we're talking about Hanukkah, we have to give one word about the menorah. But in Hanukkah, when the Maccabees lit the menorah, everybody knows they found a little jug of pure oil that lasted for eight days. But not everybody knows that the menorah that they lit didn't look like this. It wasn't made of gold. It looked like this. A minute. It looked like this. Metal poles. Somebody stole the menorah. Or maybe the menorah was impure. They took seven metal poles 
stuck them one next to the other, and they learned the menorah. But that's enough. Because we said that the whole essence of Hanukkah and maybe the whole essence of the temple is to spread the light. It doesn't matter what vessel it is. It matters the light that is spread from this place. The light. Beit HaMikdash is called the light of the world. The light of the world. And we have one second to show you a very interesting video. In the second temple, we didn't have the Ark of the Covenant. It was hidden in the first temple. Where is it now? Let's ask. Hope I have it here. We'll put it in a minute. We have menorahs. Okay. Can you play it for us? Up. Oh. Try again. Excavation took place on Temple Mount, in which three rabbis made a discovery that nearly set off another holy war between the Muslims and Jews. If we look at this sketch of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, we can see subterranean passageways superimposing upon this a model of the temple. The Jewish historical sources tell us that there was a chamber of wood or a wood pen underneath which was a secret chamber that King Josiah deposited the Ark of the Covenant in shortly before the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians. In 1981, three rabbis entered through Warren's Gate, one of the original entrances to the Temple Mount. They tunneled through and came to an area in which they claim they now have direct knowledge of the exact location of the Ark of the Covenant. Do you believe that the, some of the temple treasuries. Yehuda Getz, chief rabbi of the Western Wall, was one of the tunnelers in 1981. Rabbi Getz states that he has found the Ark of the Covenant and its contents, including the tablets containing the original Ten Commandments, hidden for over 2,500 years in the secret vault beneath the temple. These incredible discoveries were also witnessed by Rabbi Shlomo Goran. We were excavating under the Temple Mount in Jerusalem when we came to an underground room in the direction of the Holy of the Holies. And it was the Ark of the Covenant that Moses placed the Ten Commandments in. But when we came close to the Holy of the Holies, the art management of the Temple Mount decided to, to stop our digging and they erected a wall in order to stop us from getting to the Holy Ark. So we have some rabbis who already found the Holy Ark. Now all we have to do is together build the Mikdash. The Holy Temple. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you so much. I think that probably is going to pique some of your guys' curiosity a little bit. And of course, Mr. Presov is going to be here for the, uh, quite a while in his team, and you have the model up there, so you can learn a whole lot more. Get in contact with him. These are the people you want to learn from, because it says that the word of the Lord will go forth from Zion, Dvar Adonai Mitzion, from Zion. So this is where the knowledge, if you as a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, you want to connect to the truth and really to dig deep, this is where it's going to come from. It's not in the Bible Belt, and it's not in Germany, and it's not nowhere else. It's here. Our next guests are Chief Joseph and Dr. Lerlin Riverwind. Uh, they are a dynam they are a <laughs> my Hebrew now is getting uh, with the English. They are a dynamic, down to earth couple with a well grounded enthusiast for enthusiasm for life. 
Both survivors of their own personal trail of tears, the river winds are resilient overcomers who focus on forgiveness, reconciliation, and love. They build bridges of reconciliation between nations and support the state of Israel and her people as ambassadors. So we have First Nations people here to talk about the Temple Mount in Israel. It's, a, it's an honor and blessing representing First Nations who support the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, we, as First Nations people, see the Jewish people as the indigenous people of this land. Today we've been asked to share um, with the Christian community our passion for Jerusalem and the Temple Mount why it's important to us, and what we'd like to see in the future. Uh, we are not the experts to say this is the Temple Mount by physical facts. We will address in the breakout section why, what the spiritual indicators are that this is the holy ground, um, the Temple Mount. But as far as where the Temple Mount is, and if it's in the city of David, I'm just going to, since we're Americans, pull a trump on you. Wrong. <laughs> is there anybody out there who has a zeal for the Temple Mount? Okay, that's not what I call zeal, but hopefully at the end of this talk, <laughs> if you have not um, got a, a fervor and a zeal by then, you and we have wasted and, and poorly invested our eight minutes, or seven. Uh, we are learning how to negotiate time from our Israeli sister who spoke earlier. Uh, there's a tribe uh, in, the, in the northern plains of America called the Cheyenne. They call themselves the Tzitzitzah which means the people of the fringes. And uh, they have an old proverb that says, oops, let me go back here. I want to make sure I quote it correctly. A nation is not conquered until the heart of its women are on the ground. Then it is finished no matter how brave its warriors or how strong their weapons. The hearts of the women are on the ground when they cannot pray in the place and in the manner that is prescribed to them by their maker. This is how you bring a nation to its knees. And it's in the sacred place of the Temple Mount. It's in the sacred place of the Temple Mount where the Jewish people need to be praying. It is an indicator of a sickness, of something wrong at the heart of the people, not just the Jewish people, not just the Christian people of the world, if there is not a holy presence on the Temple Mount. Sacred ground is sought after real estate, both in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm. And whatever force captures that high ground has a spiritual authority over that land and over that ground. We're going to give you one of many examples of how a gateway to a spirit world can be taken. Among our people, we have many similarities with the Jewish people. Uh, not only did we suffer our own Holocaust, losing roughly six million of our own people, but we also had our lands taken away. We also walked a trail of tears, just like many of your ancestors did. And we had our sacred grounds and our holiest sites desecrated, destroyed, or conquered. The Apache Nation on Big Seated Mountain, that was their sacred mountain where they prayed. And it... Uh, incidentally, also as well, all of our people, when we pray, we pray to the east. Our lodges face to the east because that's where the sun rises and we know the creation of all things began. And this sacred mountain was conquered. It was taken from the Apache, even though by treaty, 32 treaties were made, the, the Medicine Lodge treaties, giving the right to the Apache nation to pray on their sacred mountain. These treaties were broken. 32 sacred songs describe this mountain called the Big Seated Mountain, or the High Mountain. And in the conquest of the Apache Nation, even though by treaty these sacred places are protected, the Vatican decided to take that mountain, breaking treaty law, and building what's called the acronym Lucifer, an observatory on that mountain. Looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? Little dome going on right there. 
<laughs> sacred site stolen. This is just one of the many examples of how the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness fight over the portals, the gateways, the windows to heaven. Divine authority over the land is something that we as indigenous people understand. We understand spiritual authority. The nations were placed where they are for a reason and we're given a certain spiritual authority over it uh, when we stay in the land that was designated to us. Uh, Judges 1 describes a very interesting situation where the people of Israel call out to Yah, call out to Creator, and they ask Him, who will go up and uh, who will inherit the land that you have promised us? Um, there were inheritance, there were uh, inhabitants, there were squatters in the land. And the answer came back, Yehuda will go up and win the land. But Yehuda turned to his brother, Shimon, and said, will you go with me? And Shimon did go with him. And because of that, they conquered because Yehuda could have done it by himself, but he needed that, that moral support, right? Mm -hmm. Are there any, Shimon means hearing. Are there anybody out there with ears to hear? Anybody who would be Shimon and go with Yehuda when the time is right? And not just the ears to hear, but the ears to hear and walk in obedience. Shimon, in this case, very much could be the, the, the Christian world. Will you be ready to support and be there with Yehuda when they call out to Creator and say, we need our sacred land back. We need our most holy place in all the world. Every other religion in the world, they have their sacred sites. But here within your own land, within your own country, you don't have the freedom to pray at the most holiest site in the world. There is something sick and very insidiously wrong with that. And when there is a sickness in the land, in the heart of the people, when there is a... a a problem. What is it that we need to be doing? We need to be acting out 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. We need to be humbling ourselves. We need to be praying. We need to be calling out to our Father. We need to be turning from our wicked ways. And then, and only then, will He hear our prayers, hear our cries, forgive our sins, heal our land. So when we have a sickness in the land, calling out to him for that, for that healing, then, then can the land be consecrated, and how is that done? So among our people, before the land is consecrated, the warriors go, and they dance, and they pray, and they consecrate the land once again. And there is a consecration that's going to come. The prophets have said that a temple is going to be rebuilt. It will happen. It will happen. And in that consecration of the land, there will be only one name that's, that's being broadcast to all the four corners of the earth. And it's not the name of a Syrophoenician moon god. It's not the name of any other god, but the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is sin being paraded around and celebrated in the land. There are, are names of other gods being called out in the high places, and we need to repent for that. We need the reconsecration of the land through discernment, through humility, and repentance. And when we do that, when we do that, the Father, when we rend our hearts, when we rend our hearts of the sins of putting somebody else on the throne of our hearts, then maybe Hashem, maybe Yah will take and rend the heart of the land and establish, reestablish his presence on the great high holy mount. So our question to you, the people of Yehuda, you ancient people, the indigenous people of this land, there will be a generation of Maccabees that will rise up. There will be a generation of Maccabees who will once again say, we are going to restore and retake what rightfully belongs to us, what was given to us by the Creator, because it is written by the prophets that this house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And it can only be done when the new generation of Maccabees rise up to do so. And where will you be, those in the church? Will you be the Shimons who are going to listen and obey to your elder brothers 
and say, we'll be there to support you financially, physically, spiritually, in whatever way we can, we will be there with you when this moment comes. The others have Mecca. When we learned piano playing, my sister and I, the only time she wanted to practice was when I was at the piano. Neither one of us really wanted to practice, but the only time she wanted it was when I was on it. Guess what? Let them have theirs. Let the Jews have yours. And Shimon, Christians, be there to support and stand with and have a zeal for the Temple Mount. All right, so now we're going to have a lunch break. I know that's very exciting, especially for those of you who are hungry. And then uh, those of you of the media, we have uh, giving you, I think it's about 20 minutes uh, to have a uh, media conference, and uh, we'll be meeting there. And then we'll reconvene at 2 o'clock, Swedish time, no, Israeli time. <laughs>